This is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny Episode 71. Today we're going to chat with Alex Bosco from SB Tactical, make a prank call about Gertrude's Get Rich Quick Scheme, and talk about bump stocks. Today's panel is Sean Heron and I'm Ava Flannell. And uh, I just got yelled at for having a cough drop in my mouth. And meanwhile, I could, I could like, it's, it's really tough for me to say that intro with a cough drop in my mouth. So I'm going to remove it right now. <laughs> That's a great idea. I was like, okay, yeah, you worry about that microphone. I'll worry about this microphone. You just, uh, you, you look over there. I'll look over here and we'll just be fine. And uh, to be clear, I'm not sick. I just, I have something in my throat today. Yeah. I think it's a bad attitude. <laughs> okay. Speaking of people who don't have bad attitudes. <laughs> Okay. Manicor arms. What, Actually, what you know, the hell kind of segue was that? <laughs> well, it's better than the segues you use. Uh, that's true. I'm not going to lie. So actually, um, we talked about this on episode 70, but since we have Alex here with us, Alex, I know that you collaborated with Sven from Manicor arms to create the brace for the uh, CZ Scorpion. Yeah. Um, Sven has been one of those people that has kind of been us, been with us through the whole kind of growth process of SP Tactical. Uh, I had seen some of his stuff that he's done before. He's a great engineer, uh, overall, just a great guy. So, um, it was kind of easy peasy working with those guys. Yeah. And you guys just came out with that, right? It was like in the last couple of weeks. Correct. Yeah. We just released that about a week ago. Yeah. I, I know that a lot of people were saying on social media, like, Oh, why don't you guys just create the brace? And, you know, nowadays with the braces, why buy, you know, get that tax stamp. So if you have a, CZ Scorpion and you want to get the brace, uh, you can get it. It's You guys are selling it on your website, correct? We are, yeah. We, we have it on our website. Um, you know, you can get them through the, the general channels of, you know, RSR, uh, Lipsies. There's a whole bunch of people that, that do distribute our product and, you know, you can get them at pretty much your, any local gun store. So Very no cool. issues there. And I'll definitely say that Manicorums, there's a lot of products. They do a lot of OEM work out there. So if you want, uh, if you want some Manicor Arms goodness, go to manicorarms.com. Use coupon code gunfunny15. It saves you 15% off. Check out the transformer rails and everything else that they make there. We love them. And, uh, I know you will too. Learn the things you never knew on deconstructing the industry. We are here with Alex from SB Tactical. Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. So, yeah, um, I've been back in the States now. Uh, it's funny. We're in December. I came back to the States from overseas in December 15th of 2011. Um, I was overseas. I was in Italy for quite some time. I was in the Marine Corps for many years. Then I transferred my last few years over to uh, an Army Airborne unit in northern Italy and then got out of the army and started my own company in Italy, married a foreign national, had children overseas. And then towards uh, 2011, when things started getting bad in Europe, I came back over to the U S I wasn't really planning on staying here. I was going to stay here for about a month uh, and then go back overseas. I had a six month old and a two and a half year old. And, um, you know, ultimately we decided to stay here. It was just one of those things. Uh, That's pretty cool. And yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of, you know, people ask me about, you know, Hey, you know, you know, who are you? What did you do? How did you get here? You know, and the story is, you know, I think the one thing that comes to my mind for the most part is truly the American dream. You know, mm -hmm. you think about somebody who's, you know, really comes from not much at all comes here and the opportunities here in the U S are what I guess made me what I am today. Yeah. That, that is pretty dang awesome. The company you started overseas was that SB tactical or something separate? No. So, I mean, I, I had gotten out of active duty and I was, you know, I'd started, a, I was really into computers uh, for quite some time and I was just selling computer components to OEM manufacturers overseas. And I thought that was going to be it. That's what I was going to do. I had a, a house, I had two kids, my wife is Italian, you know, and I thought that was going to be it. And then when we came back um, and I don't want to make this a sad thing, but I came back to the States, I said in 2011 and my mom had been diagnosed with cancer and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stay here. You know, business wasn't doing that well overseas. And my wife was like, yeah, let's try and, and make something of it. And that was kind of the first catalyst to kind of plant 
my roots back in the U.S. after, my God, I, I was overseas since probably 98, so quite some time away from the U.S. Yeah. Wow. Did you immediately start SP Tactical or did you do some other stuff before that once you came back? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, my ad- initial idea was that I wanted to be a police officer. It was one of my dreams. Um, I hadn't done that. And, um, that didn't really pan out. I mean, you know, being, being a police officer nowadays, there's a lot of people that want to have that job. And frankly, there's probably a lot of people that are, you know, much more qualified than I am. Um, and that didn't happen. Uh, and basically what I did was one day I was at a range, like many Marines and former army people, we, we enjoy shooting. So I was at a range and I was with a range buddy and he had lost his his arm in Afghanistan and he was shooting an AR pistol. And, uh, the range master said, you know, he's kind of spraying bullets all over the place. I'd rather you not shoot that gun. And I mean, you know, the, the impetus of that was, I was a little bit mad that this guy was getting yelled at and, yeah. you know, one thing led to another and the brace was developed. Wow. Very interesting. So how did you get into guns? Was it something that you grew up with or did you get into them? Like when you joined the military? I think, you know, it's funny. I, I, I come from a very, very left wing family. I grew up in New Jersey. Both of my parents are diehard Democrats, you know, and my mother is Jewish. My father's Catholic, but you know, that my mother was always going to like, you know, my God, my son, even as a child, I, I enjoyed this stuff, but I was kind of like, my parents would yell at me, you know, why do you like that stuff? Why do you like that <laughs> stuff? But I always kind of liked it. You know, I liked the, the way guns worked. I don't know. I mean, like most kids, we played cowboys and Indians and it was just part of it. You know, it was part of me. And as I got older, um, I found that interest kind of developed and, you know, like many people, I joined the military and the passion, uh, was developed even more. I was an armor. Uh, it was one of my many MOSs that I had many. I mean, I had a few MOSs, but, uh, being an armorer was one of them, and I truly enjoyed that. I loved it. I loved the mechanics of it. I loved the way the guns worked. I loved making them function properly. Mm-hmm. You, know, you had so, yeah. I mean, passion. I've always had passion. I think since uh, since an early age for for guns. So let's go back to SB Tactical. So you saw that you know you had an idea for the brace uh, to put on a pistol tube. Tell us where it went from there. Like the whole process. So uh, I mentioned that I was at this range and I had come, I had just come back from overseas. Uh, I had been overseas, like I had mentioned since around 98 and I was not familiar at all with any of the, the nuances behind, you know, short barreled rifles and short barreled shotguns. And I mean, I knew machine guns were illegal, but I didn't understand the complex nature of it. I mean, now I do. So, you know, now we refer to things like the national firearms act or the gun control act or, you know, any of those things. And, and most of us in this industry now are well-versed at that because it's part of our, you know, our, our daily bailwick. So when I came here, I didn't know about that. And when I came up with the first brace, uh, you know, I went home that night, I had a foam um, gun case laying around and what I did was I removed the foam inside of this gun case and I cut out uh, the shape of what would be the first brace and I sliced it down the middle so that I had, you know, two flaps and I added a strap to it. And I was like, you know what, this, this thing could work. So I taped it to a buffer tube and went back the next day. And, and in all honesty, I went back the next day kind of, I don't want to say to get back at the, at the, 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 the range officer, but <laughs> you know, I kind of wanted to, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, sometimes I can be a little bit emotional about things and it wasn't probably the wisest thing to do, but <laughs> in hindsight it was because the range master was actually good about it. And what he said was that looks good, but you might want to talk to ATF. Mm-hmm. And, and that caused, you know, a little bit of, I don't want to say angst, but it made me think about it. Yeah. And uh, what I did was I researched it online and I started to understand the concept of short barreled rifles, putting a stock on a pistol is illegal. And so I did two things. The first thing was to talk to a patent attorney. Okay. And basically contemporaneously, what I did was I wrote a letter to ATF stating my intention of what I wanted to do. And I started drafting this letter. I didn't send it right away because I wanted to see what, if this thing was even patentable. And I bought a rubber kit, which you can buy at, you know, one of those um, hobby shops. 
And my father was a dentist, so I understood that there's a theory of lost wax process. I don't know if you guys know this, but when you make jewelry, what yep. people used to do is they'd make it in wax, they'd bury it in sand, and then they'd pour gold over it, and the wax would burn away, and you'd be left with this impression of whatever it is you made in wax. Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, I did this with styrofoam, and the first piece was horrid. I mean, it <laughs> looked like pancake mix. <laughs> it was just – it was evil, but – it was a start, you know, it was something that I had made and, um, it was something that apparently nobody else had done. And shortly thereafter, you know, this was probably August, but by the time, like, I think it was November rolled around, I, I had, you know, made a few other pieces. They looked a little bit better. And what I did, two things happened. Number one, the IP attorney said, listen, you're good to go. Nobody else has done this before. And there's a lot of IP that you can get on this. And the second thing that happened was that I had submitted the the pancake mix brace and a letter <laughs> stating what I wanted to do to ATF. And this was back in, you know, I guess it was November 2012. ATF responded in like 14 days. Like they came back and, an an- and answered me saying, yeah, you're good to go. You're not making a short barrel rifle by adding a brace to a gun. So, <clears throat> and I'm hoping I'm not being too long-winded, guys. But no, no not at all. This, this is, is, great. This is a great story. Here. So what I did after that was I opened up with GoDaddy a website and I started promoting it. I went to AR15.com and I said, Hey, I got approval for this. I posted the approval. My pot, my products patent pending because it was pending at the time. And overnight, I mean, literally overnight, I must have gotten anywhere between 15,000 and 30,000 emails. Wow. So much so that, that GoDaddy blocked my, my email because they said somebody was hacking my email. <laughs> Jeez. And, um, so at that point I figured, okay, I'm on to something here. You know, I didn't have much money at all. You know, I had, I come from a good family. I mean, I had people that could help me out, but you know, the idea of making something, manufacturing it was tough at the time. So uh, we begged, borrow, stole as much money as we possibly could to make some prototypes to go to SHOT Show in 2013. And I guess at that point, you know, people had heard about it. There was this buzz going on. And so I kind of, I've shark tanked it. I, I had met this, this gentleman, uh, Grant Shaw, who was helping fund this process and he was a good business person to, to be working with. And we went to SHOT Show and we, we pitched it to a whole bunch of different companies. And the one company that really kind of stood out at the time was SIG. And I met this gentleman called Jeff Creamer, who I believe was uh, head of business development at the time. And I, I can, guys, I can remember his face to this day. He looked at me, he looked at the product, he looked at the ATF letter that I had in my hand, and he, he pointed his finger at me and he said, you wait right here. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> So I stood there and from there, one thing led to another. So we went to Century. I mean, it was just, it, it was a whirlwind situation, guys. I mean, it was really from, from nothing. This whole thing just became this, this huge beast of a company. Wow. That's incredible. How much did your first design change from like that rubber mold to the first real product that, that you manu- manufactured and then, and then sold? Not much at all. I mean, other than the fact that it didn't look like pancake mix anymore. Is that what you mean? <laughs> um, no, I mean the shape and all, all that good stuff. So, you know, we I sent something into ATF, which was basically what you guys saw as the SB15. You know, uh, there are engineering efforts that go into changing the way something looks to make it more just prettier. You know, you, you've, you've got these industrial engineers that say, no, you know, you have to put some cuts in here. You have to lighten the product. I mean, I had made this thing. It was like a pound and a half of rubber. Wow. And, um, you know, there's industrial engineers that actually work at streamlining what something looks like and it makes it more, I'll use the word moldable. You know, you, you need to be able to mold something just because you can think it up in your head doesn't necessarily mean that during the manufacturing process, you can do it. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it was a learning curve guys. I had never done any of this stuff. I was really fortunate to, to surround myself with good people and, and have some people in the industry that actually helped me out. They, you know, they saw the, the, the ability of this thing to grow and, and they were part of that process. So did you keep the first mold that you ever made? It is literally sitting behind me on the windowsill as we speak. <laughs> That's awesome. 
a, a, a place of honor on right. the windowsill. <laughs> it, it, the it pancake is. mix. No, uh, the, it, it looks. I mean, it looks like old pancake mix now because it's been sitting around since you know 2011, but it's uh, or 12, but it's uh, it's still there. I look at it and I see it every day when I sit down in my office. It's uh, that's it's a great. reminder. So you've got the SB15. Uh, the, everything's a whirlwind. You're, you're manufacturing. You're actually molding now. You've got all this going on. And then the ATF kind of hits with the, a couple different times with, with different things where they say that, you know, does use constitute? Um, I don't even remember exactly what the terminology was, but basically it one day it was fine. And then the next day it wasn't. How did, yeah. how did that go? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't that quick. You know, there were indicators that ATF was, um, looking at the way they approved it in a, in a manner that didn't reflect the initial approval. And I say this a lot and I don't want it to sound like I'm brown nosing ATF, but you guys have to realize that ATF is really just an agency that in this case, firearm tech branch, they, they're, they're making calls based on what they have in front of them. Okay. Based on the regulations that they know. And above them, you have Department of Justice. And at the time, you had Holder in the Department of Justice. And, you know, we had just had Sandy Hook. And uh, Obama wasn't able to get a lot of the the gun control regulations passed through Congress. And what a lot of people talk about, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but what a lot of people talk about is is governing through fiat. And what that means is you have an executive power that talks to an ABC agency and says, listen, I want you to interpret this law that was made. You know, in this case, we're talking about the National Firearms Act. So we're talking about the early 30s. I want you to interpret this law in a different manner. And that comes down from above ATF's head. So when they're told to do something, they, they're in the unfortunate position that they have to, they have to make certain decisions a certain way. Otherwise it's their job. Now there was a point in time at ATF where you'd get a lot of pushback. And I don't see that as much as I used to. I think, you know, when I, when I speak to some of the old timers who used to be at ATF, you know, they'd say, no, we would fight for stuff. You know, we're, we're gun guys. When DOJ tells us to do something, we push back and say, no, you can't do this for X, Y, and Z reason. But at that time, we're talking about Eric Holder, we're talking about Obama, and they were looking to make changes. And what they did over a period of, I think, about six six months, which led to the, I think it was the 2015, like a week before 2015 SHOT Show, what they did was they said, if you take a brace and you put it to your shoulder, you have now all of a sudden changed what it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've now turned it into a stock. And you, you you got out of that all of these kind of weird, you know, well, not weird, but true, you know, comparisons saying, well, if I take a screwdriver and I, and I, you know, and I use it as a hammer, does it automatically become a hammer? And there was right. a lot of that going on. So, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but it did at the end. In other words, they submitted this letter to the public the night, I think it was Friday before SHOT Show started. So nice. as you could possibly imagine, it created some havoc that SHOT Show. Yeah. And that was the misuse constitutes redesign kind of argument. And then things, so it was like that for a little while. How, how did that affect business? Well, as you can possibly imagine, it hurt business because, um, you know, we're law abiding citizens and people want to abide by the law. And I think that's, that's correct. But, for me, it was a slap in the face. I mean, I took that personally because I had stuck my neck out. I had done something. Uh, the customers who had purchased our product, they spent money and, you know, our products aren't cheap. Mm-hmm. And, um, to me, that was, you know, the point in time where I said to myself, you know what? I, I need to do something here, not just for me, for the industry and for the people who spent money on our products, because ultimately they're the ones that we, you know, that we have to respond to. And I made it a mission to change what ATF had said. So I, again, took basically all the money I had at the time and I threw it into getting a good set of attorneys. Uh, We work with uh, Mark Barnes and Michael Fawcett. They're out of DC. They're very familiar with, um, you know, the ATF and and gun compliance. And we busted our chops. I mean, I must've gone back and forth to DC to West Virginia countless times. 
And my, my opus magnum was when in 2017, ATF finally uh, agreed with us and they uh, clarified their opinion by saying that, you know, it doesn't just change the product for SP Tacticals products, but, you know, if you, I think it's sporadically, occasionally, or situationally fire a brace from your shoulder, it's not an issue. And, you know, we had to do a lot of things to get that done. I mean, it wasn't just overnight. It was a two year process that was, it was my life's work. It was my life's mission. And, um, I look back at getting that letter as, um, probably one of the greatest moments, I, I, you know, in my life, aside from my children and all that, I don't want to take away from that, but it was really a, a, a great moment for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it was a great moment for the industry guys. I mean, because people were like, wow, finally somebody got ATF to, to change their mind on something. Absolutely. I totally agree. It's gun industry lore, actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We're, we're telling an origin story. <laughs> yeah. I think that's pretty great. Clearly, that was a, a fantastic thing. I think very often, SB Tactical will get a determination letter from the, the ATF, and then a lot of other companies will just assume that that means that it's okay to do whatever. So clearly, there's competitors out there. And clearly a lot of them don't have their own determination letters, or at least in the past, maybe they didn't as much as they do these days. How does that work? So, I mean, if the ATF says that an SB tactical brace is okay, does that mean just that pretty much any brace that's similar in design is okay? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess my, my thought process on responding to questions like this is that I don't like, I don't like bad mouthing anybody else. There's people out there. I think innovation is great. Um, I don't like people copying our products, so that's something that we really look out for. But I think it's important to talk about, you know, how ATF works. And so in the case, in our case of SP Tactical, you know, we submit a product. And when you receive a letter from ATF, ATF basically is answering you for your product and your product alone. Okay. That's not to say that ATF may not give approval to something else that's similar. That's just to say that ATF is very careful to say in their letter that when they approve something, this is for you. Okay. This Mm -hmm. is not for anything else. And I don't want to mention names. I don't want to talk about it, but I thought it was very interesting that back in the day when ATF changed their mind, you know, back in 15, a lot of people who were trying to make braces at the time distanced themselves and said, Oh, that's only for SB tactical. But then years later, when we got the letter, they were like, oh, well, that, that letter's for us too. Mm-hmm. You know, I find that, I find that a bit rich and I, I find that difficult. You know, what I tell people a lot of the time is, yeah, I was in the Marines. Um, you know, I felt like I was a hard ass at the time, but the internet, you know, what people say, comments, I, I feel like I've really just kind of, I, I need to stay away from that yeah. because it's just so hard to read, you know, all of the nonsense that goes on. So, I mean, so at true. Any rate, yeah. So yeah. true. Guys, we're talking to Alex Bosco from SB Tactical. I want to take a brief moment and hear from Hackett Equipment. So within our Patreon group, we did a Secret Santa for any of the patrons that wanted to participate. And Greg from Hackett Equipment, he participated and he gave one of the patrons a big Bertha bag. And it's funny because like, when you open it, you have to record a video of yourself opening it. Uh, you don't necessarily know who it is, who it's from. And then, uh, you post it on the Patreon Facebook only page. And one of our patrons who got it, his literally, his like, his first reaction was, wow, you could fit a dead body in here because it's so big. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They, they fit a lot of guns, a lot of accessories. And yeah, I, I, I like them a lot. I especially I mean, love the FD. FDE ones that you've been getting. I yeah, I just got that one in. I'll post pictures of it. I really like it. I I actually really like that there's some Velcro in the front, so I could put a patch. Okay, patch queen. Yeah, so, I didn't call you the other word because mm-hmm. I think that would be inappropriate. The the patch W <laughs> name. Yes. Yeah, that yeah. would be inappropriate. Patch widow. Is yeah. That, okay. <laughs> anyway, you can check out the Big Bertha HackettEquipment dot com. That's H A C K E T T Equipment dot com, and there is a code Ava Gun Funny twenty, and that gets you twenty percent off. Exactly. We're back with Alex from SB Tactical, and I kind of want to move into some of today. We have heard now that the that there will be a bump stock ban. That the ATF is basically going to reclassify their opinion. There, there's a lot to unpack here, but. I want to hear kind of your thoughts with your business and 
What do you think that this reclassification of bump stocks, do you think it's going to set a precedent that kind of affects the industry and a lot of accessories, uh, even possibly braces? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not just to get the brace issue out of the way first, I'm not concerned about the brace brace issues. You know, we've, we've been here, we've been back and forth. I mean, what this type of, you know, we talked about it before and I was getting ahead of myself. I said, this is kind of government through fiat. Yes. What, what you do when you tell an agency to make a regulation is that you basically, you circumvent the way things are supposed to be done, which is making laws through Congress. Yep. So the biggest issue that they're going to run into here, and by they, I mean the government, the ATF, is that, you know, you have a bunch of people that are, you know, basically citing the law saying you can't do this. You have, I believe it's Josh Prince and uh, Adam Kraut that submitted their lawsuit right away. Yes. They were ready for it. And, you know, they're going to have a tough time. You know, I don't like to badmouth the president. I think I'm, you know, from previous military experience, you never talk bad about the president, but it doesn't seem like he's a gun guy and it doesn't seem like he really understands what he's doing by doing this. And I think it's going to come back and bite him because Mm -hmm. I don't see how they're going to win this case. You know, you can't just change the, the national firearms act. You can't just change definitions arbitrarily. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. They, they had, they have a fight on their hands and the government has a fight on their hands. It's kind of a, it's kind of a big mess. And I agree. It's uh, this governing by fiat. I mean, clearly the ATF has put out determinations on this multiple times. They've stated their opinion. Clearly uh, you have had a very large impact in, in saying that uh, not specifically for bump stock, but for the braces. And then, you know, once this precedent gets set, if we don't fight it now uh, with lawsuits and everything else that's going on, uh, it's going to be tough. Now, having been someone who's been part of exactly that, you have probably a very good insight as to what Adam and Joshua are, are in for, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I do, I do know that, you know, these guys are, are working really hard to, to make sure that what's, you know, this whole precedent is not set. I, I think what happens a lot of the time and in, in, in our industry, we tend to eat our own. I mean, I've said this before to other people, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people you can just, you can go online right now and look at the bump stock issues. And there's people that say it's a crappy product. Who cares? You know, why do you need that anyway? I mean, and they don't, they, they miss the point. Now we're not missing the point because we're making a point of saying it's going to create a precedent. We understand the slippery slope, but it's generally not, it's generally not the case in the industry. Most people, and this is not to take away from, from people, but most people are ignorant about, you know, what this means. And, and it's not an offense to say that they're, you know, they're ignorant in the sense that they just don't know, you know, it's not part of their lifestyle. It's not part of what they do. And so people don't really care about it. The reality of it is, is that things like this are the types of things that can really, really affect us. And, and, and just be really detrimental to, to what we do, to what we love. So I think it's important for all of us, you know, this is kind of a call out, you know, if you know somebody who's, who's working on it, if you know, these guys, Josh and, and, and Adam, you know, if there's a way that we can help out, we should all be helping them out. You know, if it's not money, it's time. It's trying to get the word out. I mean, whatever it is, we, we need to, to fight for our rights. Absolutely. And I don't see a lot of that. I really don't, you know, I mean, it's just, yeah. You know, we tend to give up, we, we tend to give, give up things fairly easily. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. And we are going to be talking about bump stocks here shortly, uh, cause we have a lot more to say about that. Kind of changing the subject a little bit. Do you think that you changed the industry by like really popularizing braces and making AR pistols functional? Functional? There we go. That's functional and it's usable. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, shy away from questions like this because I feel like if you, if I do say yes, I'm, I'm boasting about something. I will say this. I get, I get a lot of people that tell me that the invention of the brace changed the way the market buys guns. And I think that there's a lot of data to support that. Mm-hmm. You know, if you go to the gun stores now, you know, everybody's got a 16 inch AR, everybody's got an 18 inch AR. And what the braces did is that they made a product that was once kind of a niche, something that people want. You know, it's it's a desirable product. The brace gives the weapon an aesthetic look. It gives it a more useful uh, purpose, but it's also, 
you know, guns are visceral purchases. Sometimes you buy a gun, not because it's a tool, but because you like the way it looks. Yeah. Which is kind of what we've been doing lately. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, once you have like 20 guns, you're like, all right, well, what's next? Well, I like the way this one looks. So like 20 of the exact same gun. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, what would you say sets you apart from your competitors? You know, I think the one thing that sets me apart, and I'm not even going to talk about the product, it's just the people that I work with. You know, the, I feel like this is the one time in my life that I feel like I have the dream team. If I could choose, if, you know, if I could choose the very essence of the people I ever wanted, I have them. Uh, we have the best people working for us. You know, they do their best to get back to the customers. Uh, we do our possible best to give a product that is worth um, what people are paying for. I think that's what separates us and it has nothing to do with what we make. It has to do with who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got this, uh, you know, I've always kind of had this, this way of, of thinking and I wrote it down. <laughs> you guys are going to think this is silly, but <laughs> I have a piece of paper that I wrote to myself once and I said, well, what's my job? You know, if I'm going to be the leader of a company, what are the things that I need to worry about? And obviously, you know, the product is something, but, I wrote down five things and, and I have them in front of me. I, they're, they're pinned to the wall with a little red tack. And the first one is vision. Okay. You have to have the vision as the owner of a company. The second thing is you got to provide the resources. So even when I was in the military, you know, the most important thing when you were a leader was to give the guys that you have the tools they need to move forward. Okay. The third thing is build the culture of the company. Okay. Which I think is super important. You know, it's the attitude of, the, of who we are, you know, what do we do Fourth things kind of like, I guess it's kind of silly, but make good decisions. Okay. Make the decisions that are the best interest of the company and the people that work for you. And the last thing was oversee and deliver company performance. Okay. And that's kind of, it has to do with providing the resources, but it's making sure that when something goes out the door, you're giving a product that you're going to stand by. If somebody calls me up and they say, you know what, this thing failed or this thing broke or I don't like it, I tell people, give them their money back. If they're not happy, they need to be 100% satisfied. And we've been doing that. We've been standing by those um, those five um, those five issues. I love it. For you, some reason, I, I foresee this being in our office because well, Sean just wrote them down. I did. I wrote, I wrote them down. But let me tell you why. Because then, I also have a piece of paper and I was like, you know, Alex and I, we share a lot of similarities. My piece of paper, though, says – buy toilet paper and buy ibuprofen. <laughs> so I, I was thinking maybe I'll replace my paper add, with yours and yeah. see if, if things go great. <laughs> <laughs> maybe th I think things are going to start improving around here. You never know. <laughs> uh, although to build a good culture, I would have to n take your keys away. <laughs> okay. I'll have to take your booze away. <laughs> okay. Don't get crazy. Alex, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, what you thought your magnum opus was. Now, personally, I think your magnum opus is the SBA three. I've been using braces since the very beginning. I absolutely love them. I think that they offer a lot of diversity to the the platforms that I love. But the SBA3, I, I got one immediately after it came out. I have since bought two more. It's great. It, it's one of your newer one of your newer braces, and it's it's adjustable. So I'd I'd like to talk about the the approval process for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, the approval process in general works like this. You have a product, you have to make it, you know, you have to have something that you can submit to the tech branch. And now I'm going to get into something that everybody kind of went crazy about a few days ago, which was ATF's letter to the industry saying, you know, hey, you're going to have to submit a gun from now on. And the reality of it is this, that has been the way things have been done since basically forever. I mean, ATF it is not in their mandate to say whether something, you know, what an accessory is. It's in their mandate to tell you what that accessory is on a weapon. Okay. So you need, the reason you need to submit a weapon is because a brace on a gun can be different from gun to gun. Think about a vertical foregrip, you know, a vertical foregrip on a pistol is different than a vertical foregrip on a firearm. If I were to submit just the accessory itself, it would not have much meaning for, for the tech branch. They need to let, they need to understand what type of firearm you're going to be doing this on. Yeah. So w with respect to braces, what we did was, and this was the, the, the last time, you know, you talked about my, my Opus Magnum. I mean, it, we, we basically talked to ATF about all of our products. Okay. And what we said was, look, braces that are 
two flaps, they have a strap, or at least two flaps, a strap, and we've submitted adjustable, so things that can adjust. And we spoke to them with our attorneys present. You know, They said, what's the deal? And basically, they say, listen, you don't have to keep resubmitting the same thing. A brace that changes its aesthetic you know, look, as long as it's not changing the technology, is nothing new. You don't have to keep resubmitting. And if you think about it, it just makes sense. A brace is a brace. If it's got at least two flaps, a strap, and it's on the back of a weapon, mm -hmm. okay, unless we're changing now the type of weapon that it's on. So, uh, for example, if you look at Black Ace's tactical, what they did was they, was they, they took a brace and they put it on a firearm. So you see how it's different than taking a brace and putting it on a pistol. It's a different type of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the process is that, and when we've come to the agreement with ATF that as long as we're making braces that are of the same type of technology, there is no need or request from ATF for us to keep sending them the same thing. Makes sense. But the, so what I thought was different about the, the SB PDW, which I also have in love, um, and the SBA three is that they're, they're adjustable. You can adjust where, where they sit to adjust the length of pole and whatnot. So there's there you say that's different, but the the we we had gotten approval for that with the first brace that we did, which was on the Sig MPX. So if you think about the Sig MPX, which is an adjustable brace that is uh, on a weapon, it's the same thing as the SBPDW. It's basically the same thing as the SBA3. Mm -hmm. They're both they all adjust. They're all made with at least two flaps and a strap, uh, and they're all braces made out of the same type of elastopolymer. Interesting. Yeah. I guess I'm not too familiar with the SIG, but yeah. These, yeah, Sean, where, where were you? Uh, you where know, you I, don't, I don't shoot a lot of SIGs, really. But yeah, I, the SBA3, I love. It's become my favorite brace. I've actually replaced. Okay, you said that. I've replaced a couple of your previous <laughs> braces with the SBA3. So now you've gotten my money twice on, on the same gun. Yeah. We appreciate it. <laughs> I actually, well, I just bought one, actually. Yeah, you did. From Brownells uh, yep. last week. Yep. Absolutely. Well, keep, so. keep your keep your eyes open. We've got uh, a whole bunch of other stuff that's going to be coming out, which I, I really hope you guys are going to love. I can't talk about it right now, but there's there's a lot of new stuff uh, in the pipeline uh, there... that's along the lines of what we're talking about. So, huh. um, you know, just keep your eyes open. Very good stuff. So, uh, are there any future plans that you can talk about? Well, I mean, the stuff that we are coming out with now, I think you guys, you know, you've seen it. We came out with the FS-1913. We came out with the CZPDW. There's a lot of similar plans for different platforms that are historic uh, that I believe people are going to be really happy about. Um, I don't want to say too much more than that because I'll, I'll give it away. But I will say that, you know, we're going to be a chat show. Uh, we do have a booth this year. We may or may not have uh, a few of the things that I'm that I'm mentioning right now, uh, but uh, the best way to see it would be to either come down to Shot Show or to see what some of the media influencers post on their uh, on their Facebook and Instagram or whatever it may be. Very nice. Yeah, that is awesome, Alex. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. If people want to find uh, more about SB Tactical, your products, where, where can they find all that? So you can go to our website, which is sb-tactical.com. Or, you know, you can go to, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, um, you can do has, hashtag SP Tactical, um, you know, and a lot of the new products will pop up simply with that type of search. You know, there's a, we're all over the place. I mean, it's funny, I, I go to some of the local gun shows and every time I go there, I'm surprised to see our product everywhere. I mean, to me, it's, it's so humbling to see that. So, um, yeah, just, just keep an eye out for us. Absolutely love it. And then uh, just one final question. I think I know the answer, but a lot of times you could be wrong when you when you uh, speculate on stuff like this. Does SB and the SB Tactical stand for Stabilizing Brace? <laughs> so there's a few uh, people. That, so my wife's name is Sylvia and my last name is Bosco. So people say you named it after your daughter, Sylvia Bosco. But I have an older son who is quite jealous about that. So I can't say that it's Sylvia Bosco. I will stick with what you just said saying Stabilizing Brace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love it. Alex, do you have to run or can you stick around with us for uh, I'm, I'm a little here. bit? I got time for you guys. Aw. All right. That is, that is fantastic. That's, yeah, that's fantastic because now you get to hear me embarrass myself. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's a prank call component that is brought to you by Matador Arms. Let's talk about their Sidewinder. All right. Talk about it. What so, is it? Basically, uh, you can't put it on an AR, but you can put it on, I've seen it on like shotguns. 
AKs. You can fold it either way, like right or left. Yep. There's a lot of uh, precision chassis that you can use. You can mount it either way, so you can fold the fold the stock or brace or whatever you happen to put on it either way, either direction. Uh, I do like the Sidewinder. It's definitely a good product. We I have one on. Uh, what is that? The XTAR EXP. Funny story with our guest right now. I put that on the XTAR EXP. A friend of mine. 3D printed, uh, the XTAR EXP for those that don't know is basically just a polymer 556 AR pistol style. It doesn't have any buffer, any brace, anything like that. It, it is piston. So he 3D printed me a, a buffer adapter and then I put the sidewinder on that and then I put a pistol buffer and then I put an SB15 brace on it as well. So now I've got this awesome XTAR that just throws fireballs and it's got a folding brace as well. All thanks to the sidewinder. Mm hmm. Yep. I love it. Where can they find it? They could go to matadorarms.com. Use the code GUNFUNNY10. That gets you 10% off. Yep. And thanks to Matador Arms for sponsoring our prank calls. Here we go. It's time for Prank Calls with Malcolm and Gertrude. Honey! Morning, guys. This is Honey. Hi, uh, I just bought a few of those uh, those bump fire stocks for like five hundred dollars each, and uh, I'm looking to unload them for about a thousand. Uh, you interested? If Good you want. for you. Okay, well, are you interested? I have no desire for them. <laughs> okay, how about nine hundred dollars? Well, think about this: bump fire stocks are about to be confiscated. Why would I buy them? All right, I'll take eight hundred, uh, but you're really cutting into my kid's college fund. <laughs> bump fire stocks are about to be confiscated. Why would I buy them? I mean, confiscated. Uh, like who? Yes. I mean, who goes by that? Federal. The federal government <laughs> is planning on taking them away. All right. Look, my final no offer. Compensation. Nothing else. My final offer is seven hundred and twenty dollars. No, thank only you. Only because I'm Bye. looking to make a quick profit. Profit. <laughs> well, <laughs> he was very crappy. <laughs> Uh, that was actually pretty good. I love how no matter what he says, you just keep going down. I'm like, that's not even how negotiation works. <laughs> I know. I was doing a horrible job at Jewing him. Uh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I can say it. I'm Jewish. I know. I know. You've got the, you've got the card. All right. That That is awesome. And uh, he was definitely not interested in what you were selling. No, he that, wasn't. That's for dang sure. You know what I am interested in buying, though? What? More polymer 80s. Yeah. Especially with everything going on nowadays. Can I just say that over the last weekend, I shot the crap out of mine, uh, both my PF940 and my PF940C. How'd uh, they do? They were awesome. Yeah. I actually brought my Glock 17 and then both of those, and we shot them a lot. And yeah, I just love them. They're, they're functioning perfectly so far. I haven't had any complaints, any issues with mine uh, whatsoever. Yeah. And not only that, but they were easy as heck to, to create, like- uh, Dremel and just like, I don't know, 30 minutes of time. It takes me longer to put all the hardware in afterwards than mm -hmm. it does to actually finish the frame. So I, I do love the Polymer 80s. Uh, great quality. They they change the grip angle in a way that I actually really, really love and makes it more similar to the guns that I love shooting every day, which is the Smith & Wesson M&Ps. All right, and guys. So go to Polymer80.com. If you see something you like, use the code GUNFUNNY. That gets you 10% off. Absolutely. Tactic Talk. Discussing popular guns and gear. Love it? Hate it? Find out now. Okay, well, we're going to get back into bump stocks here because there are some other things. Now, Ava, we have 90 days from the time that this gets signed uh, to, what, hide them or lose them in a fishing trip? Well, I, I don't know. I, I read a lot of things on the internet. Okay, what do first we do? Of all, what do we do? First of all, let's backtrack. What do you mean we... I don't own any. Oh, okay. Well, I own two. Okay. Do you really have to say that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I've only said it like 10,000 times <laughs> on shows, so I can't really uh, walk it back now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that you own like six. Okay. Bye, Sean. This is how I get a new co-host. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. So uh, I got uh, an email. Go ahead. Uh, before we go on, I despise bump stocks. I think they're the dumbest thing ever. But I think, well, they were the dumbest thing ever. Now, a ban on bump stocks is officially the dumbest thing ever. Yeah. Okay. And so, but the reason why we're against it is kind of like Alex, you were saying, it sort of sets the precedent for, you know, for future uh, things that could possibly be regulated. And that's why it's really that's important that we have to fight it. 
Yeah, that's exactly. And, and, and look, I can agree. I mean, I think, you know, even being prior military, you know, unless you were a machine gunner, you know, or unless you were on some kind of, you know, exercise where you had blanks, you never use the full auto switch. I mean, it's just one of those things you don't use. It's fun though. So, I mean, it's fun and there, you know, it's not, it's not the bill of needs. Mm -hmm. It's the bill of rights. Yeah, totally. I received an email from ATF and it basically addressed how to destroy or so you could either turn it in or you can destroy your bump stock. You have 90 days to do so from December 18th. And it said in the email, you could either melt them, shred them or crush them. You can also cut it, but you had to file or follow ATF's guidelines. And I attached it in the show notes, but it, it shows like with every different bump stock where exactly you need to cut which was interesting because Sean, you said that you were thinking of blowing yours up. Yeah. And I don't think that that would actually, it would, it, it completely destroys it. Like, but, I, I, but they said that you have, you have to do those four things. Otherwise it's actually still considered illegal. Well, they can, I guess they can go glue all the pieces back together because it's going to be in a thousand pieces at the range. I mean, destroy is destroy, right? Like, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know either. It'll be interesting how they enforce this because the government, I don't know. It's not like they're going to, I don't think they're going to go door to door. It's not like they're, you know, there's much of a paper trail of ownership. It's not like bump stocks were a firearm that you had to, you know, fill out a background check for. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how they enforce this. Uh, there are quite a few companies that are bringing forth lawsuits. So I don't know. What do you think? You think that there's any chance of this being corrected or? I don't know. I, I always wonder, and you guys can tell me if I'm crazy or not. I am not a conspiracy theorist, but I play one on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> I, I always wonder if like, you know, if, if the strategy for this is, I know that this will never pass legal muster, but you know, the loud left on the political side is calling out for something and this will kind of meet that criteria and it'll never stand up to legal muster. So it's just basically putting something out there. Uh, that really has no chance of, of, of existing. But then I, I really don't think that, you know, the government is that clever or people in the government are that clever. I, I don't really know. Like, I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking because it seems like there's a lot of things going against it. Clearly, 14th Amendment kind of goes against this. And I actually pasted the the segment that I think applies. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law. Uh, I think that's important because they're requiring us an item that was completely legal by the ATF and their determination letters and legal against all the laws. And then also the, the ABC organization, the ABC agency said it was okay. So as Americans, we paid for this. This is our property that we bought legally. And I don't understand how they can require us to destroy this. I think there might be some precedent to this, but I mean, clearly eminent domain exists and – I don't know if this falls under that or not. I'm not a lawyer, but I know a couple. Eminent domain requires payment. Right, right. Requires payment. And even if they offer to pay us for them, I still think that that's kind of ridiculous. You know, this is something that I bought that was legal at the time. And I can't think of a circumstance where, you know, something that Americans bought, they then had to later destroy without any kind of remuneration. Yeah. Um, what I find interesting is that if if you look online, you can even see Diane Feinstein who is not a friend of ours say that this is not, they're, they're not going to be able to do it. It goes mm -hmm. against the constitution. Yeah. I just so. read that article today. Yeah, it's well, crazy. so, okay. There's a lawsuit brought by firearms policy coalition, mm -hmm. uh, argues that bump stock owners must be compensated for devices. that ATF had previously ruled, ruled legal. I don't know why I can't talk today. Mm -hmm. Uh, gun owners of America, ATF's claim that it can rewrite congressional law, cannot pass legal muster Agencies are not free to rewrite laws under the guise of interpretation of a statute, especially where the law's meaning is clear. So there are quite a few organizations. And not just that, but there's also the the angle of we only have an interim attorney general that hasn't been uh, put in place, I guess, through full muster yet. Um, so he does not even have the ability nor the authority to sign anything like this. Mm hmm. Um, that's, that's another angle. It just, that, that's why I'm like, it seems so stupid to try to put it through. That makes me think that maybe there's something else to it. And we constantly hear this whole checkers or uh, chest, not checkers thing, which I think is a ridiculous platitude, uh, these days, but I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I guess we'll find out enforcement. 
how, how do they enforce? Well, that's what I was going to say. I'm like, it's not like they're going to go door to door. No, they're clear. Uh, well, at this point, they're not going to confiscate them. There's been some funny memes talking about, you know, raids and things like that, but clearly no paper trail. It would be impossible to track them down. Not impossible, but it would be a Herculean task to to track them down. So in my opinion, this is just going to be one of those add on things. They go to your house for some kind of a domestic disturbance and see a, you know, an air pistol or air, air rifle with a bump stock on it and boom, your domestic disturbance is now, uh, you know, a federal felony as well. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like very similar to the magazine capacity laws here in force in Colorado in like what, July 1st, 2013. Mm-hmm. There has not, nobody has gotten in trouble solely for having yeah, magazines all, that exceed 15 or more rounds. It's all add on. And uh, of even the, I think one or two people that have been charged, it was later dropped. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I don't know. We I, will see. But in the meantime, Gertrude is going to try to sell the bump stocks that she got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. How many? You want to buy them? No. No. Okay. No. Alex, it's definitely an interesting time. I think that it's going to be a very, very uh, whirlwind kind of thing with all the lawsuits. And we all know how long those lawsuits last, especially you, Alex, kind of things going back and forth. You said you went to uh, West Virginia and D.C. very, very many times. And it's a long drawn out fight, right? Sure. I mean, it's, um, it's not easy. You have to have the right people. You have to have, you have to get in front of the right judges. You have to ask the right questions. And a lot of times people don't think about that. I think, you know, people, like I mentioned before, like, like Josh Prince and Adam Kraut and, and gun owners of America, they've got some really sharp people working for them. So I'm very, I feel very positive about what they're doing. I feel kind of like nobody's mentioning it and I hope I'm not bumping on something here that doesn't, and I say bumping, I don't mean to, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the NRA is awfully silent. Guys. Yeah. So that's, I was just going to bring that up. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, you know, like it's to me and, and look, I'm a lifetime member. I just, and I know a lot of those guys and look, I mean, I think there's some great people working at the NRA, but what are they thinking? Yeah, I mm-hmm. absolutely agree. So they've been pretty quiet. They did release a statement, but it was more about like red flag laws and stuff. Uh, well, um, yeah, the they day ended it on their Instagram, the day that it became, you know, illegal to have a bump fire stock, they just put up a picture of, uh, by Yeti and hello, whatever cooler. Yeah. And then they had it, they had to disable the comments because they think <laughs> people know. are so pissed. It's so dumb. And I, I do have some opinions on this, this specific issue, Alex. Originally after Las Vegas, they came out and they said, we, we encouraged ATF to kind of look at this again, knowing full well that they had ruled on it twice. And for me, that was like, okay, yeah, let's have them come back and say the exact same thing they've said two other times in determinations. And that was a safe way for the NRA to put out a statement condemning the act and then recommending something that they know is not going to go anywhere. However, they clearly didn't mean that because at the very end, they say that anything that, you know, basically, uh, goes over the NFA and makes something similar to a machine gun should be illegal. So clearly they were idiots in that statement, just absolute profound idiots in the entire approach that they made there that even me, the dumb guy with buy toilet paper on his desk uh, (laughs) can see. And, And then they put out a statement that they were disappointed in Trump's actions. And the problem is, is that they, they came out swinging right after the Las Vegas thing with the dumbest possible approach. So now no matter what they say, they look like inept fools. Yeah. And yeah, I, I totally agree. They're silent and they have to be silent because they were so dumb in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a theory about this, guys. I'd love to hear it. My theory is that ATF – well, sorry, I'll take a step back. My theory is that the NRA, after the the Las Vegas shooting, wanted to be proactive about something. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to kind of show that they were willing to do something and they thought – they thought that that the ATF would push back and then say, look, it's not our job to do that. That's what they thought was going to happen. And in the end, it kind of backfired on them because ultimately Trump, who, as we know, is, you know, New Yorker, he doesn't know much about guns. Ultimately, Trump kind of made this decision to to ban this thing. And he used the NRA's strategy to do that. Now, I could be totally wrong. But that's where my head is at. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. I think they kind of, they didn't see this, how this thing could bite them in the butt because they never thought, never in a million years, 
that somebody would try and, I mean, basically go around the Constitution because that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I totally just agree. My, just my idea. Good thoughts. I think so, I'll, I think Ollie North will save us all. Is- yeah. <laughs> what are some things that people can do, though, to take action? You guys asking me? I, I hope so because I, mean, I Sean, don't know the answer. Well, I mean, so I think that it is important to – I'm still an NRA member. Um, even though I'm not really happy with them right now, I'm I'm still a member. But I think it's important to donate to other organizations, Firearms Policy Coals, Coalition. Okay. <laughs> wow. If you could just step in for me because okay, yeah. it's like my Monday. <laughs> I, I wrote a big treatise on this yesterday, and I see people complaining about the – so I'm an NRA member. I plan to be a member. I vote in the board of directors elections. I think mm-hmm. that's very important. Uh, I'm very happy with some of the board of directors, and I'm not so happy with other members of the board of directors. I think the executive – Part of the NRA it needs to be fired and stripped of titles and uh, take their keys away, basically. Absolutely. I think that they've done a lot of great things for gun owners in the country. I think they've also done a lot of bad things, and we could go through that list. But I think, uh, you know, at this point, I'll just keep it keep it brief. But for the people who complain about the NRA and GOA and everything else, I think that we need to take a step back, and I think we need to look internally just a little bit. I think that if you've never gone to your state capitol uh, to go to hearings on terrible laws that happen, I think if you've never sat down and mailed a letter to your legislators, your lawmakers, uh, your House of Representatives, even your president of the United States, that you don't really have a whole lot of room. If you've never made telephone calls, like these are the things that they focus on. Yeah, okay, great. You signed an online petition at change.org or whatever the hell it was. That That means nothing. It matters nothing. And it's just pointless, really. It's great that you can share it on your Facebook profile, but guys, that's not enough. We have to get off our asses. There's eight, what, 80 million gun owners in the United States. If every one of them wrote a letter, can you imagine the avalanche of change that we might actually see in our legislators to actually represent the citizens of the United States? So we have to get off our asses. We have to donate to all these, all these, because look, NRA is the biggest lobbying arm that we have. Uh, gun, the anti-gun people, the, they are getting really good at lobbying, and you can clearly see the effects of their lobbying. If we don't have a good lobbying arm, then we're nothing. The NRA is only as strong as its members, and its members right now are, to be perfectly blunt, we are weak, and we need to be strong. And the only way that we can be strong is by getting off our lazy social media asses and actually trying to do something to make a change, whether that's going door-to-door or just mailing a letter. We have to do something to protect the Second Amendment and the United States. I'm going to add something to that real quick too, because I think, you know, you're touching on, you know, basically everybody, you know, everybody in our, who's a gun owner, but somebody from my position. So I work in the industry. I'm, you know, the owner of a company. There is so much more that the people in our industry is people in my position who have attorneys working for them, who have connections at ATF that we can do. Mm-hmm. So the, the kind of stuff that I did to work with the ATF to get them to, kind of understand, uh, you know, that what they had written was wrong. That's the kind of stuff that actually has the most effect. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because we're actually there. We're sitting in their offices. We're talking to these guys. We're making them understand, you know, and, and I don't see that. I see a lot of people and don't get me wrong. Look, we're all out to make a buck. You know, we're, we're not here for the glory. Everybody wants to make money in our industry. But the reality of it is, is that most of us are really passionate about what we do. Mm-hmm. We love what we do. We love guns. We love, we love this lifestyle. And I don't see, I mean, it could happen. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of generalizing and overgeneralizing right now. So I don't want to take away from everybody who's done a lot to work with ATF, but I don't see that. I don't see, you know, the, the, the owners, the CEOs of these companies who have these high, really high level contacts trying to make a difference. I don't see that yet. So agree with you 100% as a group, you know, gun owners need to make a difference, but I also think that people in our industry need to start sticking their neck out, their their necks out a little bit to, to, to help out more. Very, very well put. Yeah. I I think we've said all that needs to be said there. I think that's, I think that's amazing. Uh, We will move on from this topic and now we're just going to read some iTunes reviews and then uh, we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. Do I have to read them today? I don't even know why you ask. Okay. All right. So (laughs) iTunes reviews, if you haven't left us an iTunes review or a Facebook recommendation or whatever it happens to be, wherever wherever you're listening to this, just go type out a few words about what you think and what you like about the podcast. Can I also just add that this is our last, these three are our last iTunes reviews. Our last ones. So guys. Yeah. So we definitely need some more iTunes reviews. Otherwise we can't do the show anymore. Yeah. We should shut down. (laughs) 
So Squatty Bob says five stars. Best podcast to shave grandpa's back to. Oh. A po- the podcast is great. It would be better if Tickles could replace the one host named Kyle or whatever. <laughs> anyway, more Tickles. That's that's great. Tickles is my dog. <laughs> DJ87558 says five stars. Pronunciation matters. This podcast gets five stars because they know how to pronounce ambidextrous. Wasn't sure about it at first, but it's definitely growing on me. The statements they make are factual and the guests they bring on the show are great. I only have I have I only I have only listened to half a dozen episodes <laughs> And picked up two more podcasts from the people they have interviewed. Very cool. And then Balagna Hunter says, five stars. My new Ava, my new fave, Ava Flav, and her trusty sidekick, SH, in the place. They got their fingers on the pulse. What's going on with some lighthearted laughs mixed in. Featuring guests like Michael Bain and Zima Anarama. Zina Amarama. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We're Zina Amarana of March for Our Rights. Give Gun Funny a listen. It's a podcast you have been looking for. All right. That's awesome. So we always pick a winner and... Clearly, Squatty Bob is not going to win. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alex, who would you say out of the three, who would you like to pick as a winner? Um, I tell you what, man, I, I don't know why, but I, I like your stutter on Zena Amarana. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm going to go with uh, Bulogna Hunter. All right. There you go. Which is funny because when we actually had her on the show, I said her name no problem. And Ava was the one who couldn't get it, get it out even once. Which I'm not surprised because, yeah. you know, I say have it, a hard Ava. time. Say it. I uh, Zena Amarana. All right, get out of here. <laughs> Apparently, I'm the dumb one now. Okay, that's great. Uh, Bologna, Bologna Hunter, you are the winner. Definitely uh, email us, contact us via uh, Facebook Messenger. Just what, go to gunfunny.com. You'll find us. Yeah, you could do that. And thanks to everyone who left reviews. Go out there and leave reviews if you haven't. Let's start to wrap this thing up. There's a place that they can go. It's gunfunny.com, and it's got pretty much everything Gun Funny related. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can find links to all the social media, all the places where you can sc- subscribe and listen. And pretty much just everything else, but it's got a really important thing, and that's a link to our Patreon page. Uh, Patreon is crowdfunding of the podcast. It helps us do cool things like afford an editor. Mm-hmm. Kenny Ortega. Kenny Ortega is our editor. I was also going to say, we actually have a Patreon in the room that just showed up. Yeah, yeah. Tate is here. Tate Mesman. Oh, Hello. hold on. Oh, his microphone. Now you're good. Hello, guys. Hello. Tate, tell us, how do you feel about the Patreon group? Uh, it's pretty awesome. It's a lot less annoying and belligerent as we like shootings but it's, it's still a good place <laughs> all right very cool so you can get in on that uh, a fun place but last got night some- last night i actually hung out with some other patrons and uh we made a music video and i posted that on the <laughs> nice, patreon yeah, nice it's pretty cool that's great so we do actually have some patrons to call out right now uh we've got our 25 dollars patrons who are corbin bonafide iraq veteran 8888 charger arms ryan morrison and john snow and then we've got the king of the patreons which is the person who contributes the most every single month uh they're at 75 dollars right now you could unthrone them for 76 when you are the king of the patreons for over a month you get a free king of the patreons t-shirt and the pa- the king right now is 2a jewels uh john porter who we had on the show mm-hmm. and they make some awesome jewelry yeah, i mean do. really anyone who's anyone is wearing their jewelry mostly females but they make stuff for guys as well and uh, I, I highly recommend check out their stuff. Go to their Facebook page. Just put in 2A Jewels. And uh, they're also on Instagram. And uh, place your order through them. Definitely do it. All right, guys. That will do it. Ava, you have anything else? If I did, I'd say it. Sean? <laughs> she loves it when I do that. <laughs> Go to patreon.com slash gunfunny to become a Patreon. Uh, Alex, thank you so much. Find him at sb-tactical.com and all the social media. Uh, Alex, any last words? No, I'm good. I really appreciate you guys having me on the show and letting me kind of explain what we've done. You know, great job to you guys. It, Absolutely. It's we've, been awesome. We've wanted you on the show for a while. So definitely. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank, thank you guys. Thanks. Right, here we go. There's music. Want to send feedback? Suggest a place to prank call? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact.